Um, the participants are, are can hear us now, right? Hello. Okay. Hi, Tulai. So we're going to start the event and I'll have you here. I hope you can hear us well. Okay. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> we leave that there. Okay. So um, I'd like to welcome you all to this side event. Thank you very much for joining us. We had really a very special day of uh, technical problems, but we hope that from now on um, it will go quite well. Um, for the panel today, basically, um, my name is Claire Healy from UNODC. I'm the research officer and coordinator of the UNODC Observatory on Smuggling of Migrants. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction to what the observatory is. Um, before we move on to then hopefully having a contribution from uh, our colleague, Madame Tulai Juara from, from the Gambia, and then uh, my colleague Julia will talk more about the findings of the research. Um, and we will also have some uh, input and comments from Mr. Jose Maria Santana, Chema, from the Canary Islands to talk about the perspective uh, on the islands themselves. Um, so on that note, I think, um, because as many of you know, with side events, we have very limited time. Um, so I'd like to start the, the presentation by just giving you uh, an idea of what the observatory is and what we have been doing um in in our research so let me just make sure that i have this correctly and okay so hopefully uh, you can all see my screen um so today we are presenting to you the third phase of research of the unodc observatory on smuggling of migrants um, I should also say for those who wish to listen in Arabic or in Spanish or in French, um, there is a button at the bottom left of your screen where you can choose the language you wish to listen to. Um, pour les participants qui, qui voulons, eh, eh, qui voulons eh, participer et, eh, et sentir le, la présentation en français, eh, vous pouvez presser who would like to listen to the presentation in different languages, in French, Arabic, or others. Likewise, in the Spanish language, you have a button which is right at the bottom of the screen. You've got original French. I have to, to say that, but you can listen in Arabic if you push, if you press the, the button at the bottom left of the screen. Um, so, the UN ODC Observatory on Smuggling of Migrants was launched exactly a year ago um, at the, as a side event to the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice of 2021, where we also launched our first phase of research. So since that time, um, the observatory has been online. The Observatory on Smuggling of Migrants was set up to respond to a problem that UN ODC identified that there is a lack of robust administrative data on migrant smuggling at a global level. But at the same time, we need an evidence base to guide counter smuggling responses and protection for smuggled migrants and refugees. So the observatory therefore provides regularly updated, accurate and policy relevant data and information about migrant smuggling on an online platform. This is also um, as a response to the mandate given to UNODC at the General Assembly in 2019 to systematically collect data and information from member states on migrant smuggling routes, the modus operandi of migrant smugglers and on the role of transnational organized crime. So the website, as I mentioned, was launched one year ago. Um, you can see the website address www.unodc.org slash res slash som and here you'll find on the home page all of the main research conducted by the observatory and you'll also find on the tabs different information about the observatory about the methodology related publications and so on. Uh, unfortunately, we currently only have the site available in English, but it is definitely on our agenda to have multiple language versions available um, for the observatory research. 
The objective of the observatory is to conduct research in order to provide an evidence base to inform counter smuggling responses. Um, this is, of course, as per the, the UN smuggling of migrants protocol. So with the objectives of preventing and combating smuggling of migrants to promote cooperation among states on counter smuggling and to protect the rights of smuggled people. So the methodology that we apply takes into account the fact that there is very little administrative data available. Um, it's very difficult to rely only on smuggling cases that are identified and where data is shared. So instead, we conduct qualitative and quantitative research and collect information through interviews, field research, um, bringing together all of the information that we have in order to have a better understanding of the phenomenon of smuggling of migrants and responses to smuggling of migrants um, and make it available in an interactive format that's, that's easy to understand and can also be used directly to inform policy. To bring us then to the discussion today where we're launching our third story map. So in May of 2021, our first story map, so our first phase of research that you can access on the site um, and interact with the graphs and the maps and so on to get all the information. The first phase of research focused on the West African smuggling routes directed towards the central Mediterranean, so also through uh, parts of North Africa, particularly Libya and Tunisia. Um, we then launched our second phase of research, our second story map in December of last year, and that focused on West Africa, Morocco and the Western Mediterranean. What you can see that's very interesting from this graph here, which shows the number of people arriving on the Western Mediterranean route, so from Morocco to Spain, um, and that's since 2009, and th those are the blue bars that you see on the graph. Um, and you also see people arriving on the Northwest African route. So that's the route we're going to discuss today. People departing from the Northwest African coast and arriving on the Spanish Canary Islands. And those are the bars you see in green. So you can see as of the end of 2020, significant increases in the numbers of people arriving in the Canary Islands, particularly compared to the previous decade where the Western Mediterranean, the route from Morocco to Spain was much more dominant. So that's uh, one of the main reasons we, we wanted to focus specifically on this route. Um, and then just overall to tell you where we stand in terms of the plans of the observatory for the future. So as I mentioned, we launched um, the research already and it's available on the website on West Africa, Libya and the Central Mediterranean. We then in December launched the research on Morocco and the Western Mediterranean route. Today we're launching, uh, well, not officially, <laughs> um, we're discussing the, the research on the Northwest African route um, and the, the research itself, the story map will be available on the observatory website um, within the next 10 days. We are also in the phase of completing uh, research on specifically on smuggling from Nigeria, which will be available very soon. Um, and we're working on uh, ongoing research on smuggling um, of Ethiopians in Sudan, of Afghans in the Eastern Mediterranean, and the use of the Hawala system in the context of smuggling of migrants. And we're starting up research also on migrant smuggling in Southeast Asia. So uh, watch this space. Uh, we also publish brief updates on emerging smuggling trends and new research findings. Um, but that is all I wanted to say from my side for the moment, because uh, I'd like to move on quickly. We have the honor and we very much hope that this will work well, um, because Madame Tulai Juwara, uh, who is the director of the Gambian National Agency Against Trafficking in Persons, is very kindly joining us uh, from New York and with uh, a lot of technical difficulties, but we very much hope that she will be able to speak. Um, I will also attempt now to uh, to share her presentation. Madame Tulai, do you hear us? Okay, we hear you very... Can you speak again? Uh -huh. Yes, okay. We hear you. You can hear me now, so do I start? 
start my presentation now? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you to the UNODC team for um, inviting me to be a guest speaker on this um, very important forum. Um, I am Tulai Jawara Sise, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Agency Against Trafficking in Persons under the purview of the Attorney General's Chambers and Minister of Justice, Banjul Bagandia. As um, you all know, the Palermo Protocol, the Gambia is a state party to the Palermo Protocol, which is the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish those involved in trafficking in persons, especially women and children. And it supplements the United Nations Conventions Against Transnational Organized Crime. So basically, in the Gambia, we have um, the National Agency Against Trafficking in Persons responsible to combat trafficking in persons. And the Gambia Immigration Department is mandated to combat or fight against smuggling of migrants. Since the Palermo Protocol was signed and ratified and the Gambia a state party to it, the Trafficking in Persons Act was domesticated in 2007, but the Smuggling of Migrants Act is um, at its draft stage. So there's a bill, so it's very hard to combat uh, cases of smuggling of migrants in the Gambia because there's no legislation. But what we tend to do is where there are um, issues of trafficking in persons, during a smuggling process, um, the Trafficking in Persons Act is used um, um, to criminalize um, um, combating smuggling of migrants. As at present, we have a few cases on smuggling of migrants, but just to start, I mean, smuggling of migrants using the Trafficking in Persons Act. So I'll give you a brief overview of migrant smuggling in the Gambia. In recent years, the land has become a popular route for irregular migration and smuggling of migrants. The phenomenon commonly referred to as the backway, um, um, and this route has been used by thousands of um, young people in their quest to travel to Europe for a better living. It is not certain how many migrants use the backway. However, from 2017 to date, a total number of 3,000 Gambian have been voluntarily repatriated from Liberia, Libya, Morocco, Niger, and other countries along the regular migration um, route. We're looking at the perpetrators. Who are responsible for the smuggling of migrants? The perpetrators, the, 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 the suspects of smuggling are mainly private individual agents, family members, airline agents, airport officials, and friends. In 2016, 60 migrant smuggling cases were detected and stopped by the airlines and airport immigration officials. The methods of payment used smugglers who are into profit making charge between $1,500 so $1, to $2,000 to facilitate the journey of the migrant. So basically, that's um, the form of the payment. In most cases, funds are paid to family members of the contract crossing agents in Libya uh, and who are resident in the Gambia as consideration of these services for facilitating the crossing of the Mediterranean Sea into Italy. As you know, there is a distinction between smuggling of migrants and trafficking in persons. They're interrelated, they have cross-cutting issues, the interlink, smuggling of migrants is a crime against the state, and trafficking in persons is a crime against the, the, the individual. So, the forms of smuggling by, the form, the form of, of migrant smuggling by year, there's also a form. In the Gambia, smuggling of migrants take different dimensions, air, land, and sea. The smuggling cases detected at the airport are used of fraudulently obtaining travel um, and documents, altered or false documents, counterfeit documents, etc., etc. So, um, the in states is the most frequent form of smuggling detected at the airport. And now, moving on to the forms of migrant smuggling by land, generally. Migrant smugglers are in the business of recruiting and transporting migrants using land routes through Senegal, Mali, Nigeria.
Nigeria, Niger, and eventually to Libya before attempting to cross the Mediterranean, the Central Mediterranean Sea, and finally into Europe. The Cotsi of the Spanish Blue Sahel project. So basically, we work with co op and the Sahel projects in the Gambia. Um, they're donors that help the government. They, they, they complement government's effort in the, uh, the fight against smuggling of migrants. So the forms of migrant smuggling by sea is one of the most popular ones in the Gambia. Currently, the irregular migrant trends observed in the Gambia suggest that there is a shift in the irregular migration route from the Gambia Mediterranean to Libya to the Western Mediterranean route. Smugglers are now recruiting and transporting migrants in canoes along the Atlantic Ocean to the Canary Islands. Preliminary investigations into the new emerging trend reveal that smugglers who are generally based around the Cayenne Islands in Senegal and their agents are in the Gambia have the habit of um, recruiting both Gambian and Senegalese um, and, and nationals for the purposes of profit making and transporting them using the transatlantic route. In November 2017 today, the Gambian Immigration Department, with the help of the Gambian authorities, have intercepted uh, a total number of 252 migrants of both Gambian and Senegalese nationals uh, who were eventually stopped. So, uh, looking at the national measures and the legal framework in combating migrant smuggling, like I said earlier, the Gambia is a signatory to the United Nations Protocol against Smuggling of Migrants, which is suffered by land AOC, and this supplements the UN Convention. Therefore, migrant smuggling is not yet a criminal offense in the Gambia, like I mentioned earlier. However, it is uh, 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 it, it, is, it prohibits aiding and affecting unlawful entry, the possession and use of forged, unlawfully uh, uh, altered or irregular uh, uh, passports. The draft national migration policy equally addresses the issue of irregular migration. You look at the institutional framework against smuggling of migrants. The establishment of the Migration Management Unit and the Migration Center at the Tanki are tasked, amongst others, to prevent and suppress irregular migration, including smuggling of migrants and trafficking of persons. Monitoring and counseling center um, at Tanji. There's also a monitoring and counseling center at Tanji in the capacity to fight against smuggling. Capacity um, building um, for immigration officers, um, um, native officers on fraud detection, passenger uh, property techniques, identification of both smuggled and traffic victims, as well as as well as vulnerable migrants have been continuously provided. Constant and regular border patrols. When trade of the officials have been um, strategically placed at entry points such as the airport, the land borders, and seaports to detect it, deter, and prevent irregular migration, trafficking in persons, and smuggling of migrants. Now, the challenges, very important. Uh, these are the gaps, the loopholes which are the lack of adequate border uh, equipment in all the recognized entry and exit points, despite receiving a good number of vehicles from the Italian government, the mobility in terms of having adequate patrol vehicles uh, along border lines for effective and efficient border patrol and control is lacking. Uh, inadequate resources to effectively patrol the coast among the, uh, um, surveillance to detect and deter migrant smuggling. Uh, again, the lack of transit centers for reception of returning migrants. Uh, human, both human and financial, on material support. Lack of optimal requisite knowledge of immigration officers to be able to effectively and efficiently detect and combat smuggling of migrants and trafficking in persons. Again, the lack of uh, legislation. But uh, thank you very much to the UNODC for this project. Um, who recruited a consultant to work with government officials in Agadia to come up with the smuggling of migrants legislation. It's a, a, a good state now to be passed to pass
embodiment any, uh, 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 as soon as possible. Now, the recommendations to conclude in a nutshell to have the UN protocol and stop incorporated into domestic laws of the Gambia, like I just explained, in order to serve as a deterrent, the penalties of immigration act and concerning migrant uh, uh, smuggling must be made stringent. More institutional capacity building is required on technical working groups and data and migratory information sharing. And capacity, uh, uh, capacitating immigration officers on the different migratory related topics in limited with best international practices and procedure. I thank you very much and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Tulai. Um, we really very, very much appreciate uh, the flexibility that you have shown in being able to, to join us today. Um, and I very much hope that uh, the participants were able to, to hear you clearly. Um, we will see if we can keep you on board. But of course, um, if anybody has any questions for Madame Tulai, then please uh, send them on in the in the messages chat uh, or you can raise your hand later and if she is no longer uh, with us online we will definitely get the, the questions to her so thank you so much Madame Tulai Juara Sise from uh, the Gambian National Agency Against Trafficking in Persons for providing us with a very clear and concise overview of uh, both you know the smuggling trends and the situation in the Gambia um, and also what the Gambian authorities are doing in order to respond to this crime and, and in order to protect the rights of people involved. Um, so Gambia, of course, being one of the departure countries and countries of origin in the context of this um, route, the smuggling route that we're speaking about today, the Northwest African route. Um, I would like to now go from uh, from the Northwest African coast, so from the Gambia, um, to look at the specific uh, findings of the research that the UNODC Observatory on Smuggling of Migrants conducted in relation to this route. Um, I would ask Julia Serio, who since the beginning has been part of the observatory team, was also part of the field research team that conducted uh, this research on the Canary Islands in partnership with the Spanish government who provided us with some very important uh, support and coordination of, of the field research. Um, and Julia has also, um, together with the whole team, but been leading the, the analysis of the findings. So on that note, without further ado, Julia, please take over. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I will, I hope you can see my PowerPoint. Um, yes, it's perfect. That's great, thank you. Um, I'll try now to work through you through the key findings of our uh, research um, and then I hope to solicit your interest to go and read more on the website because of course we will just touch on the things that we thought were interesting but I have no time to actually go more in depth. Um, few words about the field work first. So um, this field research was uh, conducted in November 2021 in cooperation with the Spanish authorities. And so this analysis is based in the experiences of people on the move who traveled from the West African coast to the Canary, to the Canary Islands in 2021. Um, we also interviewed uh, key informants from the Spanish government, national and international NGOs, experts and practitioners. Um, and I'd like to take the chance uh, to thank everyone for, for their time, um, for the time that they took to speak with us, to share information, to share documents and to share their experiences as well uh, for those who were the survivors of this sea crossing. And, um, accepted to share their experiences with us. Um, the findings they were presenting is, are, are, have also been triangulated and updated with academic literature and specialized sources, of course. So um, you'll see different types of information. Um, first, uh, a, a short overview about um, how many people were we speaking about. So actually, um, a whole uh, all time peak in arrivals to the Canary Islands Island was registered in 2006, um, so and this has still not been uh, exceeded. So, 
so in between 2009 to 2019, we had around 100 people a year uh, who arrived to the Canary Islands, making up for 90,000 in total. And then, as you know, since 2020, we had a um, new increase um, with 20,000 people arriving in both 2020 and 2021. Although it's interesting to note this, that the majority of these people actually arrived in the last quarter of 2020. Um, and then, as you can see in the graph, where there is the peak, and the peak, and then it things slow down. Um, what do we talk about here? So we refer to the North, Northwest African route to include all the a very large number of maritime routes that connect a large portion of the African coast. So the, the southern point we found in our field work and research is Kaya. The northern we heard of is Safi. Um, there are a number of maritime routes that then connect this, um, these different departure points on the coast to the Canary Islands. And of course, there are also a number of different boats uh, that are used uh, depending on, on the departure point, um, among other, other elements. Um, something we noticed in 2021 is that there are more people departing from Morocco, and especially from uh, the closest points um, on the coast to the Canary Islands, um, and more people are using rubber boats. We actually hadn't seen rubber boats being used in the Canary Islands before uh, 20, 2021. And now we're seeing an increase in a number of people arriving in these small uh, boats uh, that are very dangerous and um, can accommodate um, uh, compare a lower number of people compared to Patera or Cayupos. Um, when we look at the profiles of the people who actually survived the sea and arrived to the Canary Island, um, we, we, we don't have very rich information in terms of statistical data. But what we see is that, for instance, uh, more West Africans arrived in 2021 uh, compared to 2020. And here you can see the graph changing. We don't really know, uh, we don't have more details about the nationalities of these people from Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately. During our field work, however, we met people from many different countries in West Africa, uh, going from Mali to the Gambia, Senegal, um, and also the profile in terms of gender and age were very diverse. Um, although overall we know that the majority of the people who arrived um, were men, uh, around 15% were women, and then 20% uh, were children, mostly actually traveling unaccompanied on the, during the sea crossing. Um, the, when we look at the incidents of smuggling along this route, we see that the groups of smugglers or facilitators have emerged since 2006. Before that, what we think is that uh, the, the travels were arranged mostly independently. But now um, the, the research actually suggests that more, most people who arrived in 2020 were smuggled. Um, although there is still a few proportion of people who travel independently to the Canary Islands by gathering these small groups and leaving from the closest departure points without making use of smuggling services. Um, despite the diversity of the profile of the people that um, use this route to come to Europe, um, we see um, it was it was very interesting to see that the reasons for using as smugglers were often the same. Um, so lack of access to regular pathways and proper documentation was indicated as the key reason for actually using a smuggler. Uh, right now, what we see is that applying for a visa that grants the right to work is costly and difficult. Um, requirements for applicants from African countries are often hard to meet. Um, and <clears throat> this applies to both um, people from North Africa as well as from people coming from, South, from West Africa. What we notice as well is that many um, the increase in arrivals from from West Africa is also um, also concerns people who were actually living in North Africa for a while and then decided to cross the sea. So 
Um, also, in terms of, of um, previous experiences, the, the, the profile of the people who are arriving to the Canary Islands kind of briefly uh, changed in, in the last year with, with people from Sub-Saharan Africa um, crossing directly to the Canary Island, but also others going to North Africa, living there for a few years, and then deciding to cross at some point. But what's common to all these experiences is that we, we, we really spoke with people who had tried several times to cross regularly and to avoid uh, res res uh, resorting to a smuggler. Um, a woman from Cote d'Ivoire interviewed by us had lodged uh, four different visa applications before um, actually giving up and, con and being smuggled and conducting a smuggle to travel from Ivory Coast um, to Europe through the Canary Islands. Um, when we look at the pro profile of the smugglers, we see that those smugglers who are operating along the Northwest African Sea Route are typically not connected with those active on land routes. So they're actually active on a very specific point, which is the departure from, from the Northwest African coast. And it's specific to the, their activity is actually specific to the sea crossing, because we, what we see is that from the departure onwards, passengers and boat drivers are disconnected from the smuggling organization and can only rely on the GPS or compass provided and their own mobile phone. Also, then usually they do not provide um, on an international phone, so passengers really rely on their own mobile phone, on their connections, on land connections uh, and phone connections from Morocco and Spain in order to make the distress call. Um, when looking at smugglers' profile, we looked at the investigations that have been conducted so far, and we see that there are several investigations conducted by Spanish authorities. Um, more details are, of course, being provided um, in the test of our sport story map. But what we can say right now is that, indeed, in 2020, one to two drivers per boat were arrested by Spanish authorities. Um, and suspects were identified on the basis of few traits. So first of all, they were all male. Um, secondly, they were mostly aged between 20 and 40 years old although less than five children were investigated by, for smuggling of migrants uh, offences um, in 2021. Um, their nationalities are also fairly consistent with um, Senegalese, Moroccan and Gambian being considered um, the nationalities which are most likely to be um, vulnerable, vulnerable to engaging in, in smuggling of migrants because of their uh, familiarity with um, sailing. Um, also, accounts of uh, the behavior on the boat, as um, per testimonies provided by other passengers or survivors, are used by um, investigators in order to identify potential suspects. Behaviors include um, holding the rudder during the sea crossing, sharing suit, using GPS, or giving instructions to other passengers during the sea crossing on how to behave as often um, um, sailors may be more, um, more aware about well, how it's best to um, behave during this uh, long time spent at sea. Um, the, so uh, the profile of the people who have been arrested by Spanish authorities in the last year is uh, almost um, all, uh, it includes boat drivers. So, most of the majority of the people who have been arrested are both drivers. Um, what we see from our research is that they are verily associated with an organized criminal group. The majority of people who drive the boat to the Canary Island from the Northwest African coast um, enter into ad hoc agreements for which they're given free or discounted passage in exchange for navigating the boat. They may actually adopt authoritative behaviors um, to ensure safety on board, and this often emerges from the accounts of witnesses. But this is also often um, the case uh, with sailors uh, providing instructions and making sure that the boat does not capsize and that um, you know the the anxiety on board does not lead to uh, abrupt movements who may jeopardize the the journey. 
Um, even in the rare instances where the bot drivers are actually affiliated uh, with organized criminal groups active in North Africa, what we see is that they usually represent very low level actors with um, a very uh, disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds in most cases um, who um, are um, engaged in this type of criminal activities for uh, very little profit. Um, when we look at the prosecutions, it's interesting to see that the majority of bot drivers prosecuted in Spain are charged with aggravated migrant smuggling offenses. What happens is because of the um, of, um, of having endangered the life of allegedly, I mean, they are accused of having endangered the life of people who are traveling with them on this boat, um, and so charged with aggravated migrant smuggling smuggling offenses and also manslaughter in a number of cases when people die at sea. So they end up spending between four and seven, but also many more years in prison, depending on how many people actually died on uh, or went missing here, uh, during the sea crossing. Um, there are concerns about access to the right to defend in such cases of uh, boat drivers being prosecuted for smuggling of migrants, are there a few specialized lawyers in the Canary Islands at the moment for a large number of cases that are actually lodged? Um, there are also elements um, of trafficking in persons that may be considered in the case of bot, of bot smugglers as the light threatening and traumatizing sea crossing raises concerns around the presence of potential elements of abusive position of vulnerability of the boat driver or um, the situation in which the boat, dri boat drivers were actually forced to commit criminal activities for a number of reasons, which are all possible exploitative purposes of, of trafficking in persons. Um, I conclude with just saying a few words on the risk that are, of course, never enough, because this is the, uh, that one of the deadliest routes uh, when we speak about smuggling of migrants. Here we compare the figures on dead and missing persons provided by um, IOM and Caminando Frontera as they actually cover different types of, of uh, instances, um, both those that were missing um, and those um, reported as dead. Um, people who were, who were smuggled to Canary Islands face different risks including being detained um, after being, in, detained, being detained by authorities on the western, on the North African coast um, as, um, after being intercepted at sea. Um, of course, they're being subject to um, suffering from sunburns, petrol burns, dehydration. These um, journeys are very, very long and they may take up to 18 days um, from two to 18 days at sea and the conditions in this overcrowded boats, coupled with, uh, of course, the presence of the engine, the presence of a little kitchen, um, the, 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 of course, um, exposure to sun and, and salt in the case of um, puns or petrol buns, of course, just make the, 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 the experience uh, more enduring. And of course, ask for um, a different type of protection response uh, once um, people get on um, rescued and uh, arrive on the islands. But that at sea is the, um, the main risk that people face uh, when traveling across um, across the, um, the Atlantic. Um, in this map, what you can see, what you can see is the current and the sea current, and um, in purple we uh, indicate the search and rescue zone uh, where uh, the Spanish authorities are active and uh, performing search and rescue operation. And what you can see is that actually the current uh, has the tendency to bring the boats towards the center of the Atlantic. And in order to avoid the border patrolling um, conducted by the authorities on the northwest African coast and the northern coast, uh, more people are now heading south and arrive, arriving to El Hierro, which uh, increases concerns um, of, you know, it's the risk, the risk of, of dying at sea. It's uh, even increasing now because of um, the, the boats on this very long journey uh, may get um, in case of an accident or in case of issues with navigation, they may get caught by the current and end up in the middle of the Atlantic.
I will stop now. There is a lot to talk about, but I really want to hear from the other um, speakers and presenters. And uh, so I'll thank you for your attention right now and hope I should continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, so obviously, you know, there's only time for a brief overview of, of all of the findings that we have from this research. As I mentioned, in the coming days, it will be available on the observatory website. So you can check that out. You can look in more detail at the graphs and the maps and so on. Um, for now, we would like to welcome our speaker from the Canary Islands. Um, we're very happy that he could join us today. Uh, he was also involved to a certain extent in the, in the, the field research that we conducted. So uh, Mr. Jose Maria Santana Suarez is an advisor on migration issues to the vice presidency of the Canaries government, the Gobierno de Canarias. Um, he is also known as, as Chema um, and he will speak in Spanish. So for those of you who are listening in English, um, please go to the panel, the button at the bottom left of your screen, uh, which says original audio. And there you can click on the drop down to listen uh, to the English interpretation. Um, so thank you very much. And yes, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you, Chema. Thank you for inviting me. I will give some seconds. I will devote some seconds to thank Julia for her investigation and uh, to allow for the listeners to move to the other channels. I am aware that the uh, research was very exhaustive and complete. About this, there's a lot to say. We could spend hours analyzing the findings, but I just uh, wrote down certain key elements to be noted. About something Julia just mentioned, which is important, you saw how in the graph about people arriving on the Canary Islands, there were higher figures during the last quarter of the year. These depend on the climatology. Clim because between September and December or January, the conditions for traveling are maybe better. better. This was an uh, important note. Around the, for the last uh, three years, around 50,000 people arrived. There are thousands of people who have died. We don't really know the exact figure. You can see the, this disparity in the graph from Julia. And then in Caminando Fronteras, there's another store, Fadafon, replicating a number of fatalities, of casualties that is similar to the one noted by Caminando Fronteras, incorporating disappeared people because academia or literature having to do with uh, forensic uh, findings insist that people who disappear over this route have never been uh, found later on. So we must insist that the use of disappear, that this word disappear uh, only uh, aggravates the suffering by families and the damage to the families of these people who have been uh, who, who have died along this route. So the use of uh, the word dead instead or faculty should be interesting to, to, to be carried out at some point because we really know that of very little people, sorry, very few people who have appeared later on. Almost all the disappeared people, 99% of them, so to say around 100% of the disappeared ones have never been found later on, so must be considered dead. A second thing that should be noted in this uh, northwestern African uh, route is that people who are smuggled are already in a vulnerability position. Uh, in many times, often, they have 
previously try they have tried previously other uh, options and have been rejected if they hadn't met so many challenges before a big part or a majority of these people should not be forced to try these vulnerability pathways, putting themselves in the hands of uh, smugglers. As you have seen, we receive people from five countries, as mentioned before, but in 2022, we saw a, a dramatic reduction in the number of these departure countries, more focused on uh, Morocco and um, Western Sahara, with uh, no information of people coming from the Senegal, from Senegal and the Gambia. However, in 2022, People coming from Morocco and Western Sahara have uh, increased. So far, 7,526 last year, 4,900, and the previous year, uh, less than 3,000. So every year we see double the figures, taking into account that the uh, uh, time, the peak time, in this route is the from September to December. So we haven't yet arrived this peak moment. So far we received around one uh, 1200 or 1300 people so that you know. On the third um, part, a third element is that people are using planes because they are able to get visa to move to other countries, so they, they uh, disregard the land route. So we've seen a uh, high level of dynamism. This is a movement, a migration movement that is very, very smart, and they try to find new survival pathways. So we are witnessing how the plane is a main option before when they try to jump into Europe. Also, the uh, cost has uh, changed and is still changing. So that depends on the uh, nationality of people, the type of boat, also gender. We see that they are paying around five to se 500 to 700 euros in, uh, in very, very bad condition uh, boats, up to three thousand to three thousand and five hundred euros using more um, or safer boats so as you see there are different classes here uh, regarding the cost we must also remember that an, uh, on average to reach from Lyon to Sahador you need to pay around 2,000 euros, and, and you must remember that 300 euros is the cost for a, a plane ticket. So imagine the difference, and people paying more money to travel. These people are in, impoverished, and they have a high likelihood to lose their lives in the, um, in the travel. As you can see, this is a, a terrible open wound of disparity. In our fourth, I'd like to mention that regarding nationality of the people who arrive, we see a wide range of countries of departure. But if we ha if we need to focus on the uh, on which are the ones, it's uh, Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea, Conakry, which is a terrible departure country from the point of view of uh, violation of human rights. Also, Mali, the Gambia, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and Morocco. This last country represented 50% of people coming or using this route, this uh, 
it's changed in the last weeks, but I still don't have the figure. But mostly in this year, people arriving came from Morocco. Then we also other nationalities that, like the Comores, which is very surprising because they are at the other side of the continent than Bangladesh or Yemen, and also from Sri Lanka. These are very, very, very long routes. They pay for three years, and then in the end they arrive in the in the islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with the feeling that they are reaching Europe. Imagine this surrealistic or surrealist uh, feeling. There is a huge flux of information between the migrants and it's not always real information, it's not always exact, so this confuses them even more. And I think what Julia said is very interesting because we have seen a lot of sailors that were not actually sailors, that they were just helping people survive. So if a boat is sinking, when someone tries to help, they kick them out of the boat, even though he or she is someone that helped. So sometimes we focus on trying to see who the pilot of the boat was in order to find someone to guilt. But most of the times, this person that drove the boat, that gave food to everyone, is not the person that is responsible for this illicit trafficking of the people. He or she just gave food to the people. And I believe that here we should check again all of these points. I'm also sharing here a doubt that I have and that I would like to place on the table. This is a difficult situation. It's a place where we have a lot of doubt as well. It's a topic that brings a lot of doubt. And we know that all of these smugglers lie and they put a lot of people at risk. And some migrants see them as saviors. Even if the system punishes them, I would like to say that we all know, or I think that we all know, a tool that could deactivate most of this smuggling system and the insecurity that these migrants go through. And it would be a different visa policy a policy that allow people to access and to go back and follow the movement to the North countries. There's a report from the United Nations that makes it very clear, that shows clearly that poverty has raised in the Northern countries. As I said before, people that come this way have tried different ways of coming to Europe and the system made it difficult for them or made it impossible. So I believe that here we should also think. So on the one hand, we should have a system that penalizes the smugglers, but also a system that creates a legal way of for migration. I believe that there should be, or that there is, an option. So my question would be here, are we just following them? Or are we really fighting against it? However, I know that there is a lot to say, but I would like to stop it here. Thank you very much for letting me participate and congratulations once again, Julia, for this amazing meeting. Thank you very much, Chema. Um, valuable and, and rich contribution to, to add to the event from, from your perspective. And I think you touched upon 
many of the points that we're also very concerned with, you know, in, in conducting this research, looking at sort of the interaction between um, prosecution, criminal justice responses uh, to migrant smuggling, and on the other hand, the protection of uh, of migrants and refugees' rights in a context of smuggling, and, and as you so rightly mentioned, looking more deeply into prevention of smuggling and, and whether a different vision, a different approach um, can better achieve that. It's very timely, I think, given the, the um, International Migration Review Forum taking place currently uh, in New York to look at how we can better address these issues. Um, these side events are, of course, very short, and I think that the uh, the only thing I can say is that we hope that the contributions that were made today by uh, by Chema from from Canarias, by Madame Tulai from the Gambia, um, our contribution in terms of research that it can contribute to um, addressing having a better approach to this situation. I think, you know, to a certain extent, when we look at at it's one of the deadliest smuggling routes in the world, and I think that requires an emergency response. Um, so I hope it's it's the beginning rather than the end. Um, I think we have one request um, to speak, and I'll ask Anna if she can um, allow the requester in. So for those of us uh, who are able to stay a little bit longer, we also have one question in, in for Julia, I think, in relation to whether any of the perpetrators or the suspected smugglers um, identified were, were Mauritania. Um, so if I can ask um, Arcadio Diaz Tejera, um, would you like to unmute your microphone and turn on your video uh, and speak? Uh, do you prefer speaking English or do you prefer speaking Spanish? Because in, in the one chair is a native language Canary Island. For me, it's impossible to take the floor. In, um, please, if, if you would like to speak in Spanish or English, it's your decision. Okay. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Muchas gracias, señora Haley. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, President. As Gemma Santana did, I would like to congratulate you on this matter. And I would like to thank all the sensibility that you showed regarding this issue and also Ms. Serio. I would like to set a proposal. Lots of analysts describe the situation. With lots of details, the description, the description that Ms. Serio did is extremely precise. The sensibility that Ms. San Mr. Santana showed is fantastic. And there's a very important point that Mr. Santana showed and I think this is the actual solution. I believe that we have to concentrate on what we are proposing. What are the propositions or the suggestions? Porque estamos perdiendo esta batalla. La población because we are losing this battle. The population is hearing every time these are the deaths that happened today, this number of people passed away today, but this will stop being on the news at some point or people will wonder, okay, how many people did this month die or how many people died today? And I believe that if we don't agree together with all the countries that are placing these migrants, the countries that are in the middle of these routes and the countries that receive these migrants, if we don't sit all together down and talk about it, this will not stop because this is a big business. And I think that there's a suggestion that is very interesting, in fact. I am not now on the CEA because I had worked there for a long time, but now I had to stop due to personal reasons. And all of the smugglers that passed while I was there, they are now in jail. Most of these patrons are migrants, and the only thing they did is that they reduced their ticket price 
And most of the times, I find them on jail, and they're there. And their only problem, or the only worry that they have, is that they need a stamp to send a letter to their family telling them, I am alive. And this, of course, is revised later on. But what I am trying to say here, Miss Helly, is that we have a lot of analysis, Miss Syria. We have a lot of data. I was two and a half years working. And I was I worked in the Council of Europe, and I know they're serious people. They identify themselves with their projects, and they have a lot of analysis. But there's a point where it's not about analysis or description, but about evaluation. We have to concentrate in proposals, in proposals, and to move not only on the evaluation, but on the practical side. That's where we will see that we are not doing something useful or more useful than humanitarian help. What I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to tell to international workers is that we have to see what proposals we have to see how these routes affect these islands. I had to check where the Comore Islands were because I forgot. I don't know where they are. And they are on the other side of Madagascar, on the other side of the continent. And I had to help people because there was a woman, for example, that was leaving because she was going to suffer ablation and her sister had just passed away because of an infection due to that. No one wanted to stay in, Can in the Canary Islands. They wanted to continue their route. So if we don't have a traffic or an, an accord or a place to speak between all the countries that are implied in these processes, this will be difficult. I know here we need to take into account all the continents that play a role here. I know, indeed, sometimes these, if these tables are not set, if we don't discuss this, will not change. I don't want to guilt anyone because I don't believe this will be the way. I think we have to change the way that this is seen. We have to concentrate on the proposals, if not, sincerely, as I've been forced to do. We should be focusing on the suggestions because otherwise m more than just me would have to ask to be transferred to another organization because uh, in my case, my health was lost in, in the way. I am so sorry. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my reflections and thank you so much for allowing me to... Anyway, I don't know who, who on, on earth invited me. I guess it was Santana. I. <laughs> There's people uh, in, Cana in the Canary Islands who have been talking about this for years. I have uh, dealt with these from different uh, jobs, different positions. I, I know that you both, uh, Madame, uh, Madame Healy and Madame Sirio, you know a lot about this, but the uh, first um, Patera arriving for Ventura was 1998. It was just two guys from the Polisario Front. Uh, so 30 years have passed and we are uh, on the same same exact place. So sorry so much, my apologies. Your uh, experience and, and your very clear call for um, what needs to happen next. Um, I can, you know, I can't share the, the, the decades and decades that you have of experience, but um, I do empathize with, with the feeling, you know, of, of uh, we can't keep on saying the same things and, and, and uh, watching the, the tragedies continue to happen. Um, I think that is uh, all that unfortunately we have time for today, but we would like to keep in touch with you, Professor, with, with um, all of the participants, because uh, as I said, I really hope that this is uh, 
you know, the, the beginning, it's not the beginning, of course, as, as um, Professor Arcadio says, but, but that we can really change the approach and we can really look at um, what really are the best ways of, of preventing this crime and uh, of protecting people's rights and, of course, preventing um, the, the deaths and, and injuries and harm that is caused. Unfortunately, I think we do have more requests to speak, but um, we are completely out of time. Um, I would like you to, to invite you all to please get in touch with us, with me and Julia and, and the rest of the team. We would like to continue to work with all of you. Um, we will, of course, keep you posted when the um, in the next few days when the research is available. Um, for, but for now, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you also to the technical team. Thanks to everyone for being very flexible with all of our technical issues. Um, we hope that we continue to be in touch with all of you um, and we, that we use this as a moment to really change the approach and, and achieve an improvement uh, in this emergency situation. So uh, on that note, muchísimas gracias. Shukran, Jazilan, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Close this event for today. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hasta luego, Gemma.